So, good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining in here. Um, I don't want to take too much time off the speaker that's coming after me, so I think we get started and then probably a couple of more people is coming in. Um, I'm Robert Kettler, I'm working for SAP. I'm in the Basis layer on memory management of the HANA database. And I'm really good at picking bad names for my presentations. So anyone expecting anything about um, like coroutines and uh, multi-threading this kind of way, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, actually, I have a couple of different topics from the HANA team basically, so I would like you to interrupt me anytime you have any questions because I will be skipping through these kind of different things and then um, it's probably hard to remember and go back um, to answer your questions. So feel free to always just get up and take the microphones. Um, so we will be talking a little bit about the inter-process resource management inside the HANA universe. And um, afterwards, I will show you a little bit more problematic things that we ran into. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the NUMA awareness. And later on, we are focusing on future developments and new research topics. And then at the end, I have like a couple of requests from colleagues that might or might not make sense to you. And then we might be able to figure something else. Uh, or we can try and figure out a solution to our problems. So let's get started. HANA Inter-Process Resource Management. I think that's kind of unique to the um, HANA-related universe, basically. So what's going on on a typical machine is we have usually the, all the HANA-related processes, and then there are some stuff that's not HANA-related, like the operating system tools and hardware vendor tools and these kind of things. And to like distribute your resources in a more or less working fashion for us, we kind of group these um, in these two universes. And the major difference between those is that um, we partition the resources uh, pretty strictly. So basically, we go ahead and say, OK, the tools on the bottom, they get a fixed amount of resources. And if they use more than that, that usually is an invalid situation. It should not happen. And then we are pretty fine if the operating system notifies us by crashing the database or whatever is going on there. So HANA systems are usually designed in a way that we say we will not use any swap. We will try to not use any page cache or anything. And all the resources are managed by the HANA universe. Everyone else will just get like a little bit. And then we take care of the rest. And the typical system looks like this. We have several different processes and tools that all take part in the resource sharing process, and they will communicate with one another to figure out who is going to need what. And as you can see, I have put HANA tools on like in, into both kind of categories, because we actually have tools that take part in the resource management, and then we have other tools that just are not really uh, able to do that. Um, to go a little bit into details here, let's start with the non-HANA related tools, um, just to give you an idea what we are looking for. Um, usually, we say non-HANA related stuff is um, using about like 3% of all the memory. That's basically it. If it uses more than that, then you need to take special actions and tell HANA to basically free up resources. And you can easily do that, but that's like a configuration issue of the administrator. If the administrator doesn't know what's going on on the system, then it's their responsibility and they their fault if the system is failing. And this is uh, not as easy as it seems to be, because if you imagine your usual system um, most of our smaller ones are like four socket machines. And you imagine, okay, there's like 3% of all the resources assigned to non-HANA related things, then the system might look like this. A perfectly balanced system on every NUMA node, there's like a little bit of memory available. Um, that would be like the perfect world. But actually, that's not how things look usually. Uh, in general, we have a situation that looks more like that. Uh, there are several nodes that are in general just exhausted. 
Um, usually those nodes are like connected to the uh, network cards or uh, the interfaces, and then usually the kernel will also use more memory on that particular node. Um, and now hardware vendor tools, and there's like one special tool that I would like to highlight that will work a little bit different. We had issues with uh, a customer that had performance issues in HANA, and they tried to analyze this from a hardware vendor side. And the hardware vendor had a neat little tool that enabled them to analyze the NUMA latencies in between nodes. And the system was in a state where several nodes were really exhausted. So what the tool actually does is it will just try to allocate a single page on every node, and then it will try and check the latencies going there. And it does this by using strict NUMA binding. So, and the very first thing that happened as soon as the tool tried to put, touch pages on one of the exhausted nodes, the, turn, the kernel took over and basically killed the HANA process immediately, resolving the performance problems. Wow. Yeah. So, most of the times, things look easy and sometimes static petitioning works pretty well, but most of the time it doesn't really. And if you're aware that your tool might fit into that range, then you should really maybe think about uh, whether or not that's a, a good idea to go in that direction. And we try to figure out whether or not we can use strict norma binding in the whole database altogether, but um, it's actually not really possible for us right now. I do have another slide that talks a little bit about this issue later. Um, I just want to highlight, even though it seems pretty simple at first, um, these kind of issues start to pop up really quickly and make things really complicated. So, and then there's the other side, the HANA typical processes. And what's going on here is that all the HANA processes will communicate with one another. It's basically a peer-to-peer -peer network where every process is um, having the same privileges and the same requirements than the others. And they will actually go ahead and tell each other what they are capable of. So in this example, you can see, um, for example, they're communicating about compactors. So the question that one process to another might have is, is this process capable of releasing resources dynamically? Can it like free their caches, or can it release ports if they are needed? Or can it move threads from one core to another and reduce their threading pool and these kind of things. Um, so HANA is going ahead and will communicate amongst all its process, the resource needs, and then dynamically reassigns pro resources to whatever process is going to need them. Um, this is basically a single uh, tenant or a single database system, so you only have like one index server that's actually consuming most of the memory, like more than 90%. But we can also have setups where you have multiple databases running on the exact same host, so at one point they might be equally balanced and every like tenant on that single system will have an equal amount of memory. But as soon as someone starts to like do high frequent calculations or just needs more resources, then they will dynamically reassign those and give them the single process the amount of resources they actually need. And we do so by having a, a strict strategy how, for example, memory is uh, managed in HANA. You can see here that we also keep track of used and allocated memory, and the difference here is just how much memory is inside the HANA memory management and how much is passed to consumers of the memory management. And what's interesting about this um, system is that in order to be able to allocate more memory from the operating system, you actually have to increase your current process limitation, and that's the, called the temporary process limit here on this slide, or TPAL. And in order to be able to increase your TPAL, you need to reduce the TPAL of an, another process. And that's only going to happen if that process plays along, so that's like a cooperative uh, resource management here. I call it cooperative multitasking. <laughs> and that's the whole idea behind this, um, system, and by doing so, we can avoid several situations. For example, we don't run into swapping, and we don't usually run into out-of-memory situation where the kernel will actually trigger the OM killer, and 
we, this worked pretty well for us so far. And what we noticed is that actually we would like more systems to take part in this kind of resource management system. We figured out that if OS vendor tools or third party tools would start to use our resource or inter-process resource sharing, we might leave or we might get into a situation where we can actually avoid running into like out of resource situations. Um, but that's kind of our proprietary way of doing things. So we are not really sure if we can push this into like a more general fashion and then if it's worth the effort for us to tag along and play along with us in these kind of things. Um, I do have an example how things usually work um, and I would like to go a little bit more into details here. Let's say we have our general name server that's running and the process is actually going into a, like an out of memory situation. Um, there are other different situations, but they're probably harder to imagine. Um, they're basically just an allocation coming in, trying to see if the cache fits or can satisfy the request. And then the general thing that's going to happen is it will scan for other processes living, tell them, okay, I need like more memory in my system, please go ahead and re remove whatever is needed there. They try to do so, and then the name saver server just takes over. This isn't simple at first, but um, the caches are way more complicated than we thought they, they were going to be. And actually, the system looks like this. We have memory for individual NUMA nodes. We have memory that we don't really know where it's coming from because it has been there for more than the process actually living. Like, when you start up the process and the executable gets loaded inside the memory, we don't actually know the NUMA awareness or anything of that area. So we treat that at a little bit different. It's not too much, so it doesn't hurt us too, m or it doesn't really matter, or this amount of memory is so little that um, we don't really care where it's living, but this can lead to situations where we actually think, okay, I consumed like 90% of the memory of one new node, but actually you consumed a lot more because you don't know where this memory is actually living. Um, you could try to figure that out using system calls, but that's also pretty expensive. Um, so we just put that aside. And the other problem that's related to these kind of things is that we actually have our internal bookkeeping, and then there's like the real world, and the kernel actually knows where the memory and everything is li living. And this might to lead to a situation where our internal bookkeeping and the bookkeeping that's uh, done by the kernel and representing the real world, um, they're not like equal, they're diverging. And slowly we're coming into a situation where the NUMA awareness in HANA will actually not represent what's actually going on on the system. And that's a huge problem because in other parts of the database, we are really rely on our bookkeeping information. And we might go ahead and when we figure out, okay, there's like a database table living on one number node, we usually move all the execution, all the processing to exactly that node and try to keep everything local. And what might happen is that by doing so and not knowing where the memory actually is, we force the database and the system to actually go ahead and um, access remote memory all the time, just because our internal bookkeeping will start to get off at some point. And we have seen this on customer systems, and it slowly degrades performance over time. And that's something we try to fix. And I mentioned a strict NUMA binding didn't work at first. And that's more or less the direction we're trying to head for. So we try to make everything really NUMA aware and strictly NUMA aware. But since the notification of um, I'm out of a memory will happen to page faulting time, we have this situation that where, where or not the NUMA information is correct will either lead to the process being killed or the memory will be there. And that's something that the database couldn't really like get working. So strict NUMA binding is not really an option for us so far. Um, we just 
use too much of the resources and are too tight on the limits so that we run into OM killer situations all the time. Um, our current approach works a little bit different and that's basically the root cause of all of these NUMA errors that we currently observe is we use preferred binding and hope for the best basically. We tell the kernel that we would like that memory to be on the NUMA node, but if it's not, then yeah, that's it. At least the database will still keep running. And this hoping for the best is actually um, something that works really well as long as you are not consuming too much memory. But since we are really putting the kernel in a, a pressure situation, since we keep so much memory cache in our system, then it doesn't really have a choice to give us the memory that we are actually looking for. Um, usually we might have enough things lying around, but since HANA just will not release the memory to the operating system, there's like no room for movement. And we actually would like to have a discussion. We would like to propose something new. And the initial problem of strict NUMA binding was that we only would know or the the error of memory not being available must, must be handled in the page folding path. And that's something we would like to get out of there. The question that we have is, um, what if we could propose a new IMAP call, for example, and this call will use strict new mobile binding. At the time the call is executed, we, the kernel should check whether or not there's sufficient amount of memory. And if that's not the case, it should just like fail the MAP, and if it succeeds, then it should reserve enough memory to satisfy all the page faulting requests that are happening in this area. And if that would work out, then we could go ahead and really build a NUMA aware system altogether. Yeah, I will pause here for a second if you have any questions to that or any inspirations. Okay, yeah, sure. Right. So essentially you don't want to pop, so you know, in normally in the kernel we don't reserve any, any kind of memory when you M up, yeah, because we allow over commit essentially and stuff like that. So, but we, we do have stuff like map populate which already does the page faulting for you. So essentially if it was like you could achieve something similar if you do, did a map with map populate, which does all the page folding and have a strict binding and at the same time. But I assume you don't want to populate at the map time, although this suggests that it would like be only a cheaper way, like how to really reserve the memory without going through all the cost of doing the actual page fault and inserting page tables and stuff like that. So yep. I'm just kind of wondering, like. Yep. My question to that would be, how can I tell the MAP to populate pages from a certain NUMA node? Well, if you would have the memory binding at that point set to strict, then it would populate from, it would populate from a NUMA node, but I, we have, yeah, I, I think yes, it will, but well, it's, yeah. it's more for our MM guys, I, but uh, that's how I understand it mm -hmm. working, so. Well, so far, oh, right, so, yeah, exactly. yeah that's a good point, so, so yeah, you can, and bind after it, but if you can't, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you can have a pair task yeah. policy, which would apply, but my question would be, so what's the exact semantic that you would like to apply that? I mean, you just want to have a sticky information about this particular memory area should be much more preferred from a certain node, or uh, what's the actual semantic? Um, the semantic would actually be that um, at the time the MX system call is executed, the kernel will actually go ahead and reserve or populate the pages at the mapping time, basically. Um, so you would populate that area? Yeah. The only question would be, um, so, so far we are just M mapping memory and then afterwards we are M bonding and page vaulting everything. And the question is, um, how can I like damp that down to like a single system call that will actually fail if there's not sufficient amount of memory there?
Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, oh. So, wouldn't be the solution for you to actually just globally disable overcommit of memory? Because you are, you are apparently not interested in that feature of the OS, right? What the, so my, okay. I think we can disable overcommitting, but how does the... Um, you, would, you would then get enomem immediately if, if there's not enough memory for you to MF. Exactly, then MF would fail. But the question there would be, how can I trigger the failure of MF based on the memory available on a certain NUMA node. Because overcommit will actually fail if I consume too much uh, virtual address space. But now we're talking about failing if there's not, like, basically enough virtual address space on a certain node. Okay, yeah. That wouldn't help. Yeah. But it's going in the exact same direction, only with these additional NUMA semantics. Okay, the next topic that um, I've prepared is um, actually a feature that we've discussed with other colleagues from a different company. Um, but it got us really interested. And we still have problems with scalability of the uh, kernel memory management on large scale systems, um, usually more than 28 socket systems. And what we usually do is we use AMAP and UNMAP to interface with the kernel and try to satisfy our memory requests. At a certain point, we realize that many times when we're inside garbage collection processes or these kind of things, we will UNMAP memory at one point and then we will later AMAP memory at another different place in the virtual address space. And this usually results in at least two system calls working out things, and we realize that we can actually save one system call and one going through the semaphores and everything by just remapping a block from one portion to another because the remapping will actually do the exact same or will have the same semantics from moving or removing one BMA at one place and then putting it somewhere else. So that's more or less a shortcut that we figure out. And it comes with a neat little benefit that pages will actually be moved along and you don't have to re-zero everything. And this makes interfacing with the kernel about an order of magnitude faster than uh, just mapping and unmapping memory. And we tried to, or this approach is working pretty good for us, but um, we've seen more recent um, systems coming up that are even larger than everything we've seen before. And now we start to run into really heavy uh, scalability issues on these machines. And now we try to figure out if there's some other way to achieve the same semantics that we currently have with mapping and unmapping memory, but not using this system calls. And one thing that we <coughs> were introduced to was uh, the feature called user fault FD SIGBUS. And what it actually does is you can mark in virtual address space as whenever there's a page fault happening in that system, just crash the process or send the process a SIGBUS signal. And what we try to achieve with that is that we like to control just the page table and the physical pages that are um, inside that and avoid um, modifying virtual memory areas altogether. So the general idea here was what would happen if we could avoid all the kernel memory management modification except for modifying page table entries. Um, that's basically what we try to do here. And it works like this, that whenever we would do an MMAP um, in our current system, in the new system, we would go ahead and page fold in a certain range that we expect to be valid. And whenever HANA is trying to access any other memory address, we will receive a SIGBUS. The same way is if you use MAP, you will usually get your SIGSEC V. 
And then we have like this additional uh, problem of removing the pages here. And then we usually, or in this scenario, the equivalent to unmapping and a certain uh, VMA area would be to just remove the pages using Madvice don't need. So we try to build an equivalent of mapping, unmapping, and remapping memory using the user fault FD SIG bus that we think will just avoid modifying the virtual memory tree. And um, the remapping is, uh, isn't actually working because the patch has not been accepted by the community so far. And I don't think there's anyone actually like looking forward to see these kind of things. At least that's what we have been told. Um, so there's no yeah, real test using the remapping semantics here. But I've tried to figure out how the um, performance implication or the scalability would look like in these kind of systems. And what we did is uh, we have a dedicated test that runs a fixed workload and f tries to figure out which strategy is the fastest. And what you can see here is the test running under certain conditions and um, the, uh, the lower the results are usually the better ones. And we actually tr um, benchmarked transparent huge pages versus not using transparent huge pages. Um, there's actually one thing missing, but the UFFD implementation actually does not support transparent huge pages so far, so it would be a little bit unfair to compare it here, or it wouldn't really make any difference. And from the results that we gathered, you can actually see that um, the current remapping strategy that's like the lowest line here is about a factor of 30 faster than the UFFD implementation. And we were wondering how these kind of things could happen because in our sense of, or in our understanding, we are actually doing less work and it takes uh, more time to, to get there. And yeah, that's kind of one one thing that we were really wondering about. And you can also see that transferring huge pages would actually have a huge benefit on HANA as well. Um, even removing our remapping strategy so far. Um, it's a little bit unfair because our remapping does not actually um, take care of moving to megabyte aligned to megabyte blocks and these kind of things. So we're actually splitting transparent huge pages all the time. And the other th major reason we are not using them so far is that um, HANA is actually crashing with those. So we couldn't figure out what's going on. And it seems to be some kind of timing issue and we don't really know whether or not that problem is inside HANA or somewhere else. Um, so we are still on investigating this, but you couldn't see that the different kind of strategies have really different scalability behaviors and using just plain MAP and unmap is about a factor of like 15 slower than remapping memory all the time. I mean, I talked about it like an order of magnitude, but usually it might even be a little bit faster than that or a little bit more than that. And this is actually a really small system for us. It's just like 100 cores. And if you go ahead and ramp that up to 1,000 cores, then basically all the strategies that now perform pretty worse are off the charts. And that's one of our major problems here. And the test actually just stresses the kernel memory management. You can see that single thread is running through pretty fast in like three seconds for the remapping case. And then with 100 cores, we're already at like 400 seconds runtime. So we are basically losing a factor of like 200 or something like that if we scale up 100 cores. And that's even worse for like bigger systems. I mean, it's not like every single thread in HANA is in the kernel's memory management all the time. So um, it's not actually that worse or it's not that bad. Um, so when we were looking at like the, the later part of this chart, then we are actually uh, usually on like a thousand cores machines because only like 10% of all the threads are in the kernel's memory management. And this is really one thing that we try to get, get going. And we've already discussed several different strategies like 
range locking, and we would really like to see this getting in there and trying to solve the problems. Yeah. Is this test uh, done in the full HANA environment, or is it some self-contained micro benchmark that could be published, perhaps? <laughs> That's actually a self-contained micro benchmark, and so I think you, you should have access to that. Okay. Or at least I know I've sent around like one version to you at least. I don't know if it's possible to look into the source code, but that's pretty trivial to be honest. But yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we can go ahead and <laughs> investigate ba based on, on that. Um, yeah, so this is still a topic for us that we try to investigate. Um, but the new solution that came up like earlier this year is like also off the charts. It's like 30 times lower than what we currently have. So there's probably either a little uh, benefit from looking into that because I cannot really see how optimizing the solution will get you know, like these uh, vectors faster. but. Maybe it's still worth a try. And then what I like about this chart is you can actually see that our remapping solution is uh, slower than using MAPs and unmaps with transparent huge pages. So um, that's basically what we might be going for as soon as we figure out what's wrong with them. Okay, next topic I do have is uh, our supportability tools and other weird stuff. So uh, maybe we just start with the weird ones. Um, yeah, I've put some code up there. <laughs> um, what actually is missing here is uh, we have a function that copies code. So basically, we'll go ahead, remove the read protection, and the semantics behind that is we actually try to intercept certain functionalities in other libraries. Um, the glibc will try to call its own MAP implementation and not use the PLT for that. So for us, it's not really possible to intercept these MAP calls and all our instrumentation and these kind of things. Um, so we just patch the functions. <laughs> Um, it's not only the glibc, it's not only the mapp call. Um, there are a couple of other ones. So if you think about exposing symbols, then probably that might be <laughs> of your interest <laughs> uh, as well. Since um, I don't really like that code, but I understand that's necessary to do that kind of things. Um, it's the same story with like, other calls like uh, opening connections, opening file handles, and these kind of things. Everything that has to go through HANA supportability tools. And the only reason why we actually do this is that we can track the amount of memory the glibc is uh, consuming. Um, we also do this for the runtime linkers and these kind of things. So um, it's not only the single third-party library that we need to patch, but it's one of the most popular ones um, because all the other ones usually link against uh, these calls using the PLT. Um, yeah. Any questions to that? <laughs> uh, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Maybe. Um, why not use ptrace <laughs> if you want to intercept this calls basically um, I think ptrace is way too slow for us to be honest possibly but I'm just asking if you ever tried or um, I think I need to refer this question to Ivan I don't know where he's sitting <laughs> yes it's too slow okay <laughs> that's a fast one <laughs> question yeah. um, it's maybe now that he's gone <laughs> um, actually we are just not intercepting the uh, MAP and AMAP and these kind of system calls we actually also override um, many CXA allocates and CXA throw and unwinder functions and these kind of things um, so 
ESP trace would work for system calls perfectly. It might not work for our user space uh, overriding functions. Um, other supportability tools that we were asked for. Um, the regular or the default value of profit maps is I think something like uh, 60K or round about that. On HANA system, I think it's like two billion or in that uh, area. And usually we uh, don't like to, but we have sometimes to print profit maps. And with like two million or billion areas, that's, uh, yeah, quite some effort. And one of the questions that rise was, uh, do you think it's possible to get an interface to just like print a certain amount of that um, at runtime, basically? I know the VMAs are kind of internal information and the user space should not rely on those. Um, but there are other things that we see in these kind of uh, areas. For example, sometimes we try to remap memory and that memory actually consists of multiple VMAs, and then the remap call will fail because it cannot remap across VMA boundaries. And then it would be great to figure out, okay, where's the boundary? For now, I could go ahead and scan profit maps, but then we have the problem that this basically slows HANA down to, to a state where it's basically stalling for several hours. And um, so we figure out it might be something we could uh, get along and see whether or not it's possible to get these kind of information outside of the kernel, but yeah. Now we are asking for internal details, basically. Yes, so theoretically, uh, the, the file could support seek operation to the address, because okay. it's using that internally, but maybe it's not possible now, but could be perhaps. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And then basically uh, on the exact same topic of moving virtual memory errors that are, um, or moving ranges of multiple v virtual memory errors, mm -hmm. one question that rose was, um, is it probably possible to just have a dedicated system call that merges an area of anonymous memories? Um, this will also get rid of the problem that we're currently facing sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> then I have like two more topics to discuss. Support for actual <laughs> operative multitasking or coroutines in the GCC8. Um, this has been a feature that many people ask for because they like the way asynchronous programming is working and that's something um, we would like to see in HANA as well, because then we can offload a little bit of our execution and working and these kind of things into, yeah, the programming language, basically. Um, it would make a lot of things easier. We do have our own implementations using like macro magic and these kind of things, but that's not really neatly usable for all the different colleagues, so. That's basically what a lot of people have been asking for. And then, oh yeah. So uh, the core routines, you're talking about the new C++ stuff, right? Exactly. Um, well, the patch is still in the making, right? It's still in development upstream, so it will most likely land in GCC 10. Um, oh, wow. for, so next year, somewhere next year. Um, for GCC 8, I, well, actually, the question would, would be for GCC 7, because that's the system compiler for SLEE 15. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we would have to look at real the, really the patch to, 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 to say something about back portability, but uh, my, my gut feeling would say uh, unlikely, because it entails new APIs in the, new APIs in the standard C++. Um, so that's unlikely to happen. Uh, as a backport, so I, I, the only realistic outlook would be to wait for GCC 10, basically. And yeah. I mean, there's there's an upstream branch already that that where, where the development happens. 
you could try that, of course, if, 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 if something already works. I, if, I personally have no idea how, how, how the state is, how far, how far the person that does that is, but um, yeah, that would be something to try, but otherwise I, I don't see it as realistic to, to backport that. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about GCC 10, that will be slash 15, like SP2 or something like that, or? And that will be in the next two, so, so we currently we are the toolchain module at GCC 9, right, or well, will be in a couple of weeks. Uh, and GCC 10 will most likely happen one year from now also in the toolchain module. So yeah, yeah, and then, and then for all code streams, so for SLE 12 and SLE 15. Okay. Well, I think that sounds great, or do you have any comments on that, Ivan? <laughs> okay. It's, it's just that you have to be aware that if you compile something with GCC 10, then, then the users of your software need to have the runtime libraries also from GCC 10, right? I mean, we do that usually as, as, as um, maintenance updates, updating the runtime libraries, but it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. And, of course, that GCC 10 will be supported only for one and a half year. And then you either have to move to GCC 11 or, or back to 7, but then you lose the feature, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, then we have to see because um, SAP is always on the latest and greatest releases of, uh, I think, slash 11 SP4 or something like that. So, um, yeah, then we will probably stick with GCC 7 for a couple of more years and then we might bother you again regarding backporting this, if it's possible <laughs> and not like too much effort. Um, the last question I do have is, uh, we do have several requests and that's not only memory related, but um, most likely a lot of customers are asking us whenever allocations fail or system calls fail, they would like to have an information why that happened. Um, for memory management, we mostly see stuff like we either are in a reload of memory situation or, for example, we have hit the max map count limit. And customers were asking for whether or not it's possible to return the information why the system call failed to the user space application. Um, we did this in HANA. It was quite some effort to get like every allocation or at least every uh, location that something could go wrong and write an additional notice to that why things might go wrong here. Um, but yeah, that, that would be at least something that would please the interests of certain groups of people. So I will just put that up here and probably you can think a little bit about that. Yeah, well, and that's basically it. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, um, let me know. And if you'd like to discuss things offline, feel free to contact us. <laughs>